And next up, we're going to go to a CEO spotlight conversation with Anne Wojcicki. She's co-founder and CEO of 23andMe, along with David Rubenstein. He's co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group. And thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, when COVID began to arise in the United States, did you realize that you had some information that could be uh, applicable to helping to solve COVID or identify what some of the causes would be? What did you do when you came to that realization? The first thing we realized is that one, um, we, we weren't gonna play a role in testing for all kinds of reasons. We're not set up to do COVID testing. But what we really are set up to do is to do research at scale. 23andMe has the world's largest consented platform of customers who are ready and engaged in research. So what we did on April 6th, we decided we were going to put out a COVID-related survey to our customers. And um, you know, a matter of weeks later, we had a million customers who had taken our COVID survey and we had over 20,000 individuals who said that they had had COVID, thousands who had been hospitalized. And by analyzing that data, we were able to find that there is a genetic, um, you know, there's a genetic type where O blood type uh, looks like it is protective, eight, you know, nine to 18 percent protective uh, from COVID. What about uh, people who are, let's say, uh, African American? Do they have a higher propensity to get COVID? Did you learn that as well, or not? We have seen that. And even when we have looked at, you know, adjusting for other components that, you know, other socio, you know, uh, you know, illnesses or other socioeconomic factors that we do see that there is a higher propensity of likelihood of them being sick. So that's part of the reason why we're continuing to do the genetic studies is because we want to, you know, we want to see what else we could find. And I just just as background for people. Um, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of viruses, there are genetic mutations in, in humans that make you either more susceptible or resistant. So for example, in HIV, there's a mutation called CCR5, where people who have that mutation are essentially immune to getting HIV. And when I look at sort of why certain populations are, are you know, getting sick more or some people um, you know, die or they seem to be exposed but not get it, it makes me think that there are going to be more genetic findings. So what did you do with this information once you got it? Did you give it to the FDA or give it to uh, CDC? Who did you give it to, if anybody? The most important thing for us to always do with our information is to publish as quickly as possible. And so we, we always put things when we feel like it's really important, we put it in a bio archive. So it means like the publication is out there now. So people can go and get access to this information. We also made the information available for any pharma company or any group that is working on this area to contact us and that we would engage in trying to help further um, any kind of research on a vaccine or treatments. We also, there's a number of consortiums that are out there with academics to try and bring all that data together, and we're partnering with all of those as well. So you have a lot of experience in dealing with FDA. Uh, to those um, manufacturers of vaccines, what would you tell them about how to get through the FDA process? I would say the most important thing with the FDA is engagement and communication and, and finding people who have that expertise of um, you know the experience of how to work with them. The thing, the mistakes that we made in the past really had to do with a level of naivete on our behalf of how to communicate effectively with them. And it's one thing that I've learned with the FDA um, is you know when they when they have a vision, when they tell you they want this kind of a certain kind of analysis, there's there's not a lot of negotiation. Like you 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 follow what they are asking for. So in 2006, you started this company, and your yeah. premise was that people would spit into a little vial of glass, mail it off, and you would tell them everything about their ancestry or about their health uh, predispositions. So did people tell you you were crazy at the beginning? Oh, yeah. We had, um, we had some really fun meetings with people where... Um, you know, my background is I, I was working, I was investing in healthcare companies and I saw the ge genomics revolution taking off. And I was really disappointed in, from the time that the human genome was sequenced to, you know, you know, many years later that it still wasn't accessible to individuals. So I wanted to create a company that was going to be 
directly accessible to individuals with their genetic information. And, um, you know, in those early days, I had people, um, we were, you know, prohibited from being in medical meetings. I had people walk out of meetings with us. Um, you know, people thought, uh, you know, had all kinds of, you know, scary theories of what you would potentially learn with genetics. And I think what's happened is that people have really learned that your DNA is, um, it's like looking in the mirror for the first time. It's your digital representation of you. And it's really exciting. And the same way there's you know amazing things about you and there's things that you might wanna change, your DNA is reflective of that. And so people are learning, you know, their, their ancestry is different than what a lot of people think. And they can understand you know, families that have had, you know, heart disease in them or diabetes, they can look at their DNA and they can say, oh, there's potentially a genetic association. And what we've always wanted to do is to give people the tools to think about actually preventing disease rather than just treating it. And that's what we're really focused on now is how is it that you can learn all this information about you and inspire you now to take action to change your behaviors. So do people say to you, I want the results, but if there's a negative results, like I have a predisposition to dementia or Alzheimer's, don't tell me that. Do they do that or do you just give them all the information? We have the ability for some of the information that we know is more sensitive for customers, they have an additional opt-in. And that means that for instance, on the Alzheimer's report that you reference, there's an additional layer of consent. So we don't just give it to you, but we say, hey, do you really want the information? Here's some background about what types of things you're gonna learn. And then we, then we allow you to get it. And I think that the thing I've always, again, my focus on healthcare has been um, about consumers having choice. And one thing that I've always found, frankly, offensive in the healthcare system is that other people are making choices for me. And what I think is really important is that you actually get choice and it shouldn't be your insurance company. It shouldn't be your doctor. It shouldn't be, you know, the hospital administrator protocols. It should be about choice for you and giving you those opportunities to get that information if you want. And if you don't want the information, absolutely don't get it. Now, your initial premise was I'm going to tell you about your genetic background, but you also have a business where you tell people about their ancestry in the sense of, uh, who they were related to or might not have been related to. Do you find a lot of people find out that their biological parents weren't their biological parents or their biological siblings were not their biological siblings? And is that embarrassing or are they actually happy to learn this? It's one of the things that in the early days, we, um, I remember we, we would hypothesize, like, wouldn't it be amazing if we could actually reconnect a family? And I would say we actually on a daily basis get... Um, dozens of stories of people learning that they had cousins that they didn't know about, they had siblings they didn't know about, um, and and you do find the the news that you know you're you might not be related to your father, that your siblings might be half siblings, and it's definitely um, you know it can be stressful for people to 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 learn that. A absolutely, we have a whole website now dedicated for how people manage this. But overwhelmingly, what I am really happy about is how much this has connected people. And we find that people are, um, you know, making, making connections with their family and almost filling a hole and a void in their life that really bothered them. So for a lot of adoptees, so for instance, for us, my family, we actually found that we have a first cousin. And so I can relate to these stories. You know, here was somebody who, um, you know, didn't know his, his you know, his um, his birth parents, and he was an old, raised as an only child. And holy cow, suddenly he's now part of the Wojcicki clan, and all of us. And and so, and we had no idea that we potentially had this first cousin. So there's a there's a whole process, but it's wonderful to find, you know, this family and and to and to connect and and to see the similarities. Well, how many people have uh, given you their saliva to date? Over twelve million people. Wow. And do you it's get lot. tired of, it's a lot. Now, do you get tired of people asking you, when are you gonna take your company public so they can buy shares in it? <laughs> I actually, you know, it's, it's one of the things I think about. I would love to find a way for my customers to feel like they could be shareholders and be part of it. It's something that we've always thought about. Um, 
so no, I, I again, I come from the Wall Street world, so I've I I know enough about um, being a public company to know there's no there's no glory in having to to manage to to you know manage all of that work about being a, a public company. But at the right time, we'll absolutely um, you know engage it. I think it's it's important for a company to be public when they're mature enough to manage it. And I think what's been important for 23andMe is that we are very much of a mission driven company with um, you know, a goal of creating a different type of healthcare ecosystem. And in order to do that, we're gonna have ups and downs. And it's better often to have ups and downs when you're a private company than when you're a public company.